On tonight's Classic Car Special, footage from the recent Classic Motor Show at the NEC. First, though, we travel to Buxton on the edge of the Peak District. Buxton is the highest town in England. And as a result of this, it's probably the most car-unfriendly town when it snows. But we were lucky when we went to film the Classic Car Auction Preview Day at the Octagon Hall in the Pavilion Gardens. H&H Classic Auctions was established in uh, what, late 93. We actually held, held our first sale in November 1993. We hold um, six classic car auctions a year here, always at the Pavilion Gardens in Buxton. We can't find a better setting than this beautiful. Generally speaking, we would only have 80 lots, wouldn't we? We this restrict time, it yeah. to 80 lots. But oh. because of the demand for this particular right. sale, uh, we've actually taken a few more, but back to February next year, it will be back to 80 full stop. A few more Christmas presents for people, you see. The classic car market has come more stable and prices are definitely on the move, upwards. Best improvement are mint restored cars or specialist cars, Ferrari, Dino, something like that. Totally original Rolls cars Royces as well. like that one there. Uh, really nice cars, making good money. The one-off payment, which is an entry fee, which guarantees your entry into the catalogue in terms of cost into the sale, is £75 plus VAT, £88, for which in general you can't get a decent advert in the local classic press. Uh, the only add-on charge to that is if the car actually sells, where we charge a, uh, a seller's commission of 5% plus VAT, which is subject to a minimum of £100. Uh, and that's the only charge that he has. Uh, and for that he'll have two pe 2, 000, over 2,000 people looking at his car. There is a buyer's commission, we actually call it a premium, uh, which is levied at 5% plus VAT on, upon a successful sale. And obviously our commission rates um, looked on very favourably compared to the London houses for sake of argument, where their buyer's premium would be 15% plus VAT and their seller commission would be 10% plus VAT. Outside, ladies and gentlemen, lot number 16, the 1975, the BMW 3-litre CSI Coupe. has had an absolute fortune spent on it, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we estimate that to fetch in the region of 3,000 to 3,750 pounds at today's sale. Setting from last, apparently, off the production line, with leather trim, electric windows, air conditioning, uprated engine, and of course the five-speed gearbox. Someone will be really wanted to buy that car. A lot of people sell at auction because it's of the ease and less of ha lack of hassle for them. Not everybody wants people coming round to their homes and wasting their time for sake of argument. All they need to do with us is bring the car down, leave the rest to us, we take care of it, we spend the money on the advertising and so on and so forth. In terms of the best prices, very difficult to quantify, but it's also very difficult for a private owner to actually know what today his car is worth. He either will have an overinflated value of it, in which case he'll advertise it and not get any calls, or he'll underprice it and the world and his wife will ring. Here there'll be two and a half thousand people valuing, not just valuing his car, but trying to actively buy his car. Now for that, obviously, we charge a service charge, which we've already gone through in terms of the commission rates. Um, but he will also get a cheque within eight working days for us, no messing about, from a guaranteed strong company. Uh, generally speaking, no hassle. When you also take it to the gentleman may have, or, or lady in fact, may have a collection to sell, trying to get rid of 20 or plus cars, we had 26 cars off one source in the last sale, trying to dispose of 26 cars at one specific time would be extremely difficult. Uh, obviously, to go to auction, all his worries are removed, we get them picked up, we bring them here, they're cleaned, sorted and presented in front of the buying public. Lot number 28 is a 1977 XJC 4.2, the two-door coupe Jaguar, presently uh, in the logbook, a titled owner, and that's estimated to fetch between two and a half and three and a half thousand pounds. The 77 Jaguar XJC, which is actually outside this particular car, it's quite in good condition really, leather upholstery, which is obviously an extra at the time because a lot of them were fabric. It's, it is a nice, nice example of today. One is reluctant to say that classic cars actually increase in value, albeit over the years, if you look back to the 60s, 70s, they have increased realistically with the reflation all the time. Um, but they certainly won't depreciate as fast as a modern car. And therefore, if you are a low mileage user, 
I certainly would recommend looking or investigating the classic car market with regard to buying a Jaguar saloon for sake of argument. Um, because I think you would find yourself financially better off, and I think that's one. Of, those are probably some of the reasons why the interest is also perked mm. up in the market. Especially with the low insurance rates today. Absolutely. I mean, and anything over. A, well, ten years old is classed as um, specialist insurance now. That's right. Yes. And providing you're doing under three thousand miles for sake of a, of a figure, the, the uh, insurance rates are significantly very cheaper. low. Very low indeed. Lot number thirty-one is a nineteen eighty-five Alfa Romeo GTV two-liter. Lovely car, it's actually outside with us today, one owner and 48,000 miles, and that's estimated to fetch between three and four thousand pounds. A modern day classic, if ever there was one. That one's been entered by an elderly chap from near Macclesfield, who, believe it or not, the, the car is in stunning condition. He drove it here this morning, the only reason for it is he's 80 years old, and he feels he's got to sort of retire from driving, but what a lovely car. Basically, if you buy anything right, that is old, be it an antique coin or whatever it happens to be, and you buy it right as such, uh, you probably won't go far wrong. But of course it's very subjective as to what is right on a particular day or not. Also outside, ladies and gentlemen, lot number 42, the Datsun, the 240Z. Lovely car, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most popular cars in America. A lot were exported over there, but this is an original English car. And we confidently expect that today to fetch between three and four thousand pounds. One of the nicest ones I've seen actually, being well restored and of course so many of these have really been rock boxes and become basket cases to rebuild but this is really nice, quite a stunning example. If one ignores the, the high point of the market in the late 80s, sort of 88 to 1990 and actually plotted a graph from the 60s upwards you will have seen that classic cars like paintings, like any uh, collectible item has increased in a nice steady arc and I think that will continue every day. At the end of the day they're not making any more so we're, we're stuck with the number we have now. Lot number 38 ladies and gentlemen, Alfa Romeo, the Duetto Spider, probably one of the nicest Alfa Romeo shapes ever built. That's in today's sale estimated to fetch between seven and ten thousand pounds, a delightful car. And of course it does have the boat tail. Uh, and I think as time goes on, you will find more people want to be involved in a classic car or a boat or a classic aircraft or whatever. And so I tend to think that over a period of years, they will all increase, but some more than others. Some will always be more desirable than others. Jaguar E-Type, it's the 3.8 litre fixed head coupe, lovely car, estimated today to fetch between 16 and 18,000 pounds. Funny enough, that's coming from Buxton, which is, of all places, not got far to travel with that car. 67,000 miles is believed to be genuine. Um, there's no doubt in that, really, because you look at the paperwork and the history, it's probably right. A lot of money being lavished at it. I hope he does get a good price for the car when it comes to the sale. One of the beauties of the classic car market is that everybody wants something different. What yeah. you like is not necessarily what I like and what you want to do with it is not necessarily what I want to do with it. So for sake of argument, I want to, might want to take mine out on a Sunday in nice weather. You might want to use yours as Every daily day. transport. Correct. And yeah. therefore there's horses yeah. for courses. I think in the definition, I think there will always be in my mind a difference between a classic and simply an old car. Right? But that would be different mm. for somebody else. He will mm. probably agree that there's a difference but what we'll disagree on is what models they are. One That's man's right. meat is another yeah. man's poison, for sake right. of argument. Also inside and next door to lot number 80, the Rolls Royce, is lot number 49. The 1934 Triumph Gloria, ladies and gentlemen, a very rare sports saloon, delightfully finished in grey and black and been stored for many, many years. And that's estimated to fetch between four and a half and five thousand pounds. I don't think we've ever had one of these for sale before. Quite a rare car. Be interesting to see what the car does actually make when it uh, is being sold with us. But well restored by an elderly chap. Also in today's sale, ladies and gentlemen, the Alfa Romeo, the Gear Spider, made famous, of course, in that very good film, The Day of the Jackal. In lovely condition, expected to fetch between six and nine thousand pounds today, ladies and gentlemen, a left-hand drive example, ready for export and ready to be enjoyed by its new owner. Of course, this car was imported from South Africa, but very well restored, and as you probably know, Rust free. Lot number 61, a lovely car in genuine condition there. 
is a 1961 Jaguar E Type 3.8 Roadster, a flat floor model that is in lovely condition and expected to fetch between 20 and £23,000 at today's sale. Quite rare indeed today, one of those. The particular car that's coming in for sale has had its flat floors taken out sometime early on in life, but is quite rare and all the heritage certificate is to go with it. Matching numbers, engine and gearbox, um, someone will take that one on definitely. And at the end of the day the floors can be put right and it can be made into a proper flat floor roaster. Another of our top lots to lay, ladies and gentlemen, lot number 79, right in front of me here under the stage, the Ferrari, the 246 GTS Dino, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely superb, two owners from new and the present owner has had the car since it was two years old and we confidently expect that to fetch between 37 and £40,000 at today's sale. Finished in obviously the best colour in red, with black trim. The present owner of this car has been, been with it since it was two years old and the mileage of just over 60,000 miles is believed to be correct. It is absolutely superb, and when it came in, it sounded stunning. One of the uh, top lots we have today is lot number 80, the 1924 uh, 20-horsepower Rolls-Royce Cabriolet. It's a seven-seater, uh, used to be part of the Walt Disney Corporation, and has been used in various films. Delightful car, finished in red, uh, and estimated today to fetch between 40 to 44,000 pounds. The 20 horsepower Rolls Royce was built by Joseph Cockshoots of Manchester. This particular car is a Cabriolet, which is a seven seater Cabriolet, which is in beautiful condition. Really beautiful. A few of the nice features it's got it's got a wind down division, it's also got the occasional seats in the back. Uh, the first owner, interestingly, was somebody, a lady in Colwyn Bay, who bought it new and had it for over 20 years. Lot number 91, ladies and gentlemen, a Bentley, the Special Sports, entered by a collector who's owned it for the last 10 years. Delightful car, actually converted from a Vandenplaat drophead, ladies and gentlemen. We expect that car to fetch in today's sale between 30 and 35,000 pounds. My car is a 1934. Bentley, um, it's got a four and a quarter litre engine and it is the type of car that pre-war raced Brooklands, Isle of Man, um, different venues around Britain and Europe. I've owned it now for 10 years and during that time have done some 10,000 miles including 3,000 miles around Europe without any problem whatsoever. The car was sold when brand new to a lady um, and originally it was bodied as a Vanden Pla drop head coupe with four seats and obviously a hood. Now it's been rebodied in 1981 by a Bentley specialist by the name of Alan Paget um, in the style of um, a TT team car um, of the type raced by a gentleman called Eddie Hall in the early 30s and obviously it's carried this body since then. Very fast car, very thirsty but lots of fun also. And produces, to be exact I'm unsure, but lots, lots of horsepower and sounds very beautiful when on song. Should we start it? Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's sale. We thank you very much indeed for coming here today. We look forward to seeing you at our next sale. And please have a very safe journey home. Thank you very much. After the break, more beautiful cars from this year's National Classic Motor Show. The 1996 National Classic Motor Car Show at the NEC in November attracted more than 28,000 people, a record for the event. As modern cars become more reliable and more alike, the public's desire to roll back the years gets even stronger.
Highlights of the show included the Triumph Stand, a vast array of European sports cars, and of course, Jaguar. This is one of the cars we featured in the December issue of the magazine. This is an XK120 Jaguar, produced in 1948. Probably one of the most sensuous, probably one of the most beautiful cars Jaguar ever produced. They followed this up with the E-Type Jaguar, and they now bought out the new XK8 Jaguar, which has been a huge success in the modern car market. But I think this um, XK120 is a fantastic machine. It was a, a sports car beyond belief when it appeared at the Earl's Court uh, Motor Show in London. Um, in, the, in the late 40s, and um, we featured it as one of the five fastest cars of the decades, and it really is a fantastic car to drive. You can tell the lineage of the XK8s in this, can't you? You can see it. Yes, yeah, certainly. The sort of feline, very flowing, very sort of uh, beautiful looks of the car have been followed up with the E-Type Jag after this, and now the XK8 have really sort of got back to the old car sort of heritage that they really were very good at in, these, in the good old days. It's been said that one of the reasons for the growth and in interest in classic cars is that so many modern cars are rather featureless, perhaps the XK8 accepted. Do, do you, how do you explain the interest? Well, I think people, modern cars are very good. They're, they're all the same these days. They become sort of like, um, I suppose, appliances. That's their problem. They're, the fact that they're so good is almost they're, they're down for. And people who want something a little bit more exciting are looking for older cars because they have a lot of character. I mean, some of that character is, is probably because they are a little bit, um, they require a little bit more maintenance, a little bit more care and a little bit of looking after in, in comparison with modern cars. But they're very individualistic. I mean, if you look around the show, you've got two-stroke Saabs, you've got Tatras, you've got mid-engine cars, you've got rear-engine cars. They all were individually designed as opposed to modern cars. These days. I mean, as opposed sorry, to, yes, to modern cars, which are very much almost out of the same jelly mold, out of the same factory. Um, you know, they all computer designed and they all follow the same sort of, um, of engineering approach. So while they're very good, they're very boring. People always ask me the question, what do I like as a car? I mean, it's, I, mean I have terribly Catholic tastes. I mean, I like all sorts of cars for all sorts of different reasons. I mean, the cars on our stand, we have Ferraris, we have the Jaguar, we have a beautiful old Alfa Romeo, which is worth a million and a half or something ridiculous, which is totally unaffordable. But I like sort of some of the peculiar cars, the Tatra particularly with the rear engine, flat eight cylinder engine was bizarre. I mean, an amazing motor car out of Czechoslovakia from years ago. Um, you know, there's so much to see. There's a D-type Jaguar or two. The Jaguar Heritage stand has some beautiful cars on its stand. And I wouldn't, I, w I, I walk around, you know, the show and every time I see a different car, I feel I would I think of a reason I would like to buy it. And I think of a reason trying to rationalize how I could possibly own it. But they're all different and you can't particularly choose one over the other, I don't think. The car is a Triumph 1020 Sports, which was manufactured in 1923. It was the first model that Triumph produced. And it came over to Belfast in 1923. Uh, it sat in a showroom for one year because the car was so expensive. In 1923, that car cost £430 new. And it sat in a showroom for one year until the original owner uh, went in and bought it and when he died uh, 31 years ago I got the car I bought the car now it has original mileage it has covered it's 12 horsepower by the way it has covered 80,000 miles as original the body everything is absolutely original it hasn't been restored in any way uh, the old owner kept a very detailed logbook of every journey he did, the exact time he went through every village at, the exact mileage. For instance, if you take 1928, 1928, Saturday the 13th, these are all Irish villages. He travelled uh, through Dundalk, which is in Southern Ireland, which was 56 miles from Belfast at 116. His average miles per hour was 32 miles per hour. He left in dock at 57 miles at 136. He stopped for his lunch at 59.3 miles at 147, resumed the journey at 231. Now the interesting part is, he arrived in Castle Blaney at 74 miles at 318. He got a puncture 
at 78 and 5 tenths of a mile <laughs> at 3.33 he changed the wheel and commenced the journey at 9 minutes past 4 and the cause was a nail <laughs> so I don't think anybody could keep a more detailed account of motoring as what Mr. Strain kept. So we gather it so, takes just over half an hour to change the wheel on this car. Yeah, so he has this uh, logbook is full of that sort of thing. In fact, there's parts in it that I haven't even read yet. Jim, I hesitate to point this out, but after you took it over, the logbook goes strangely blank. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm a little lazy. It's uh, a 1924 Cadillac, Sedan Neville, seven seat limo, V8, flathead, side valve. We've had the car approximately um, six months. The only thing we've had to do since I bought it was retrim it, because the gentleman only before me had it for 20 years and he wouldn't drive it. It came from a place in Aylesbury. Uh, before that we had a 1927 Buick, which was a lot smaller than this, and the gentleman wanted my Buick, I wanted his Cadillac, so we've done a swap. Tell me about the interior first. Uh, the interior, like I say, was in brown cloth because all the old cars years ago, in the 20s especially, all used to be a yucky brown. So we've decided to put blue. Uh, the dashboard is pretty standard. Uh, you've got the eight day clock, you've got a little round speedo, I've got to 75. The car is capable of doing 90 miles an hour, believe it or not. I've had it round to 75 miles an hour. It's great getting up, it's stopping that's the problem. Uh, you don't have a fuel gauge on this, it's a pressure gauge because there's no such thing as a pump on this, which I'll show you afterwards uh, how that works. Um, amp meter, it's a six volt system, like I say, V8, updraft carburetor, and uh, I'm dead chuffed with it. How often do you use it? How often is it on the road? Um, if it's a fine day, I'm out. Not that it's just a fine weather car. On these particular cars, this particular car weighs approximately two and a half ton. And the brakes on it are very, very narrow brakes. They're linings, you know? And the slightest bit of damp, and you've got no brakes. Well, with today's cars, that's not good. Come and show us the engine. Most certainly. Like I say, it is a, a V8 flathead side valve, which is a wow for you, chop boys. but. I'm not chopping this one. <laughs> now it's electric starts, which Cadillac, I believe, were the first people to make an electric start. And the starter motor is situated in here. It's a foot start. Once you've got the car started, that starter motor automatically cuts out and then it becomes your alternator or dynamo to charge your battery. There's no such thing as a fan belt. It's a uh, prop shaft driven off the starter motor, straight through the top and onto your fan. So you've got no problems with fan belts or chain or anything break because it's got this beautiful, beautiful shaft that runs down the top of the car. Like I say, V8, flathead, side valve. The nice things about these, in the old days, the car were a bit of a darling to start, so they had these little primer chambers here. What you have to do is just put a spot of petrol in each chamber all the way around. Then the driver will sit in the car and he'll say to you, right, and each and every one of these valves you open up and the petrol drops down and usually the car will start. If it doesn't start then, then you've got big trouble. Join us for more from the Classic Motors Car Show after the break. Welcome back to the Classic Motor Car Show, where over two days in November, motoring enthusiasts from around the world gather to admire some of the finest cars ever produced. It's a TVR V8S, uh, that means it's got a 4 litre V8 engine in it, which uh, wrapped around a little bit of fibreglass makes it quite exciting. And uh, this year we entered a series called the Midland Speed Championship, and they had a class, uh, especially for TVR motor cars. And 
I was persuaded after not competing for the last 28 years to have a go. And uh, we've had a wonderful year, thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, managed somehow or other to win the class. Uh, I think all the other boys stayed away or something, I'm not quite sure. And uh, even, even nicer really is that the club itself have this Scott Moncrief award or trophy and uh, it goes to the highest scoring points competitor which apparently uh, we achieved so very exciting thoroughly enjoyed tell me about your the performance of the car um, as i say it's got a four liter v8s engine in which is based on the rover uh, but there's not much of the rover engine left so it's got special uh, crankshaft special piston special cylinder heads special cams etc develops 260 brake horsepower uh, in a car that weighs sort of just under a thousand kilograms, so the power to weight ratio is tremendous. Uh, very quick motor car, it was about 147, 0 to 60 uh, in about four and a half seconds. Um, exciting. <laughs> I knew you have a reputation for going sideways sometimes. Um, it has been said and it has been written. Uh, I think it's nothing to do with the driver, I think it's something to do with the tyres. <laughs> Now, of course, as well as being a CBR owner and award winner, you're also the organiser of the Classic Car Show. Um, it would appear to be a very good year. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is the first day of two days that we're open, Saturday and Sunday, and uh, we seem to be doing very well today. We've now run this show for three years. We've doubled in size each year, and the crowds today are tremendous. Uh, it, it's not really... Uh, it's, a, it's a show very much dedicated to the enthusiast, to the classic car enthusiast. And uh, there's a lot of them here today, and I hope they're having a super day. This is a 1954 RME, uh, one and a half litre saloon, which I've owned for about two and a half years now. When I got it, the body had been uh, restored, but the uh, underside needed cleaning up, and I basically stripped the car back to the bare chassis, uh, painted all underneath. I've renewed all the suspension, the brakes, uh, the um, steering gear, and uh, also fitted a, a new engine. Is it possible for you to say what percentage of the car is original as against uh, remodified? Or the, 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 the bodywork is original. Um, obviously as cars age you're bound to have to replace mechanical parts and also some body parts if um, corrosion or rot sets in. So it, it's, um, although cars may be described as original, it's certainly to original specification but of course obviously to keep up with modern um, legal requirements, if nothing else, you have to uh, renew things like tyres, brakes, um, steering components and so on. Can we see under the bonnet? Yes, certainly. So, tell me about that. Right, well, the, um, this, the engine is uh, probably unique to uh, Riley's. It, the twin cam design was designed by Percy Riley in 1926. Uh, for the famous Riley 9. The uh, camshafts, in fact, are not overhead camshafts as you might think from the um, position of the rocker boxes. The camshafts are, in fact, set high up in the sides of the cylinder block and they operate the valves through short, stiff push rods. The valves are inclined at 45 degrees and uh, that provides a hemispherical combustion chamber. You have a cross flow head with the carburetor on this side and the exhaust on the other side. So, he, right from the start in 1926 it was a very very efficient design and uh, although the engines differed in capacity um, sizes the uh, basic design soldiered on until 1957 when it um, was last used in the Pathfinder. Tell me about the performance. Well this is a one and a half litre saloon and the body is fairly heavy weighs about um, 25 2600 weight so performance is not startling. The, um, I think the original road test reports gave a 0 to 60 time of about uh, 25 seconds, something like that. Um, once you've got it rolling, then um, it will roll along very nicely. But uh, it, 
is a it, it will not accelerate away from traffic lights like a modern car and of course you do the weight does tell when you get to a hill where you're rapidly going down through the box now a two and a half liter engine car like the um, drop head there that uh, would be good for nearly 100 miles an hour and will um, easily keep up with modern traffic uh, these will cruise quite happily at about 60 miles an hour but um, although you can go faster top speed is probably in the region of uh, 85 87 miles an hour um, you are thrashing the car somewhat to maintain that speed for any distance what about braking and handling characteristics well when i when i took it for its mot the uh, tester said that the brakes would do justice to a seven and a half ton truck We have got uh, V8 pilots and a friend that we know said, got a car in, in a garage, been in there for a few years, you might be interested. So Ginger went and had a look at it and he was more than interested. And so we took it on. It, um, everything was there, but it was some of it needed a lot of restoration work. So basically we've come apart, every single nut and bolt, everything's been apart and completely rebuilt refurbed pieces found that and remade that needed it and uh, so complete sort of chassis up restoration. Do you know the history of the car, where it was before? Unfortunately no, um, we only know that it was been stored in a garage for about 10 years, it was taken as settlement of a bad debt but we don't know when it was imported or unfortunately anything else about it. We met an Argentinian uh, when we took it up to Osterley Park and he confirmed for us that it was made in South America and that it was a 1936 and why it was right hand drive because from 1928 to 36 they drove on the right hand side of the road and then they changed but I didn't think at the time to get his name and address he might have been able to help us get more but that's all we know. Are you aware of how many other cars like this are in existence? No, not very many. Um, as far as we know this is the only one of the moment on the road in this country. We know of others sort of either being restored or laid up but I wouldn't like to say how many exactly. Talking a bit, being on the road, are you? how often are you taking it on the road? Well, its debut this year was at um, Alexandra Palace London show in March. And since then, we've been out and about to a lot of outdoor shows. So it's done about 1,500 miles since then. Tell me about its performance. First of all, this beast of an engine that there is here. Well, it's a side valve V8 3622cc. Um, cruises very nicely about 60, 70 up the motorway if you can keep out of the lorry ruts. <laughs> um, very nice to drive. Petrol consumption? Oh, I think it's probably about 12, 14. Yeah. Most of the going. Yeah. What about handling and braking, those kind of basic security things? Not too bad. You've just got to try and look about five cars ahead to see who's braking rather than one car ahead. But um, not too bad. Is this um, the crowning glory of your classic car ownership, this car? Um, I don't think so. I think it will just carry on from here. <laughs> I think we're both a bit uh, bitten by the bug and collectors, so I think it will grow. So uh, you confess it is an obsession and that there are other cars out there that you want to have? Yes, and I think it's a case of if you can't beat them, join them. So I might as well join in as well, and I enjoy driving them, and we get a lot of pleasure out of them. It's a Jaguar XK120 and uh, I rest, uh, restored the car the last six years and this summer uh, I come over to England uh, to do the National XK Day and uh, it was a winning car, I won the uh, first prize and that's the reason uh, why I'm here now at the moment. I gather you bought it, it's a left hand drive car, you bought it from the States? Yes. The car uh, is imported uh, from the States to, uh, to Holland and there I buy the car. Tell me something about um, its performance. It's a very fast driving car. Uh, I drive with the car uh, 120 miles an hour. There's more from the classic motor car show 
after the break. Welcome back to our classic car special. Welcome back to a world of obsession where the minutest attention is paid to the minutest part of a motor car. To some people it's an interest which can be sated over a weekend. But for most of the car clubs here at the NEC, preserving, maintaining and showing their cars is a full-time commitment. Certainly the highlight of this show is that there is a huge Triumph display. I'm happy to have been involved in that. Uh, all the famous Triumph cars of the past and a lot of the clubs are all together. That's certainly a highlight. The other highlight is, look around you, this is a very busy show and this is a real delight to the organisers. A lot of um, famous designers from the past have also turned up here. That was the nice thing about the Triumph display. Harry Webster, who's a very famous, distinguished uh, chief engineer of the past, Harry came along this morning to see some of his cars and to see the members. And the members were absolutely delighted. Tell me about the Triumph uh, stand in particular, it's, it's full of goodies. There was space for about 25 cars, well of course we could have put 50 or 100 in there. There is a choice of, of the most significant Triumphs of the past. There were no Triumphs built after the early 80s of course, but most of the earlier models are there. Of course the Triumph stand, which is magnificent, nevertheless no longer in production. Is there a danger with classic car shows like this? That the great British marks, the sadness is those marks no longer exist. Well, that is so. The, the joy of shows like this, of course, is that the famous mates are going to be preserved. If you look around, you will see big Jaguar clubs, big MG clubs, big Triumph clubs. They're the ones who are keeping the names alive, and uh, the motor cars are in absolutely wonderful condition these days. I also sense there's a trend, an increasing trend and interest in Americana, the classic American cars. Yes, there is, and, and it, wouldn't it be wonderful to own a 1950s Cadillac with fins three feet high at the back? The, the supply is so good, there are so many of these cars around, a lot of them are coming over the Atlantic, and there are some very big, thriving events like this for American cars. In all your years covering the classic car scene, do you think interest in classic cars has ever been as great as it seems to be today? No, it's growing, and I think the, the, the pompous thing to say is because modern cars are so boring, people come back to cars like this. They might not have been reliable, they might not have been waterproof, but they were so much fun, and most of us here have got at least one toy in the garage that we bring out on summer weekends. At a conservative estimate, these cars are worth a staggering £15 million. To some owners, classic cars represent a good investment, but most are not in it for the money. If anything, their obsessions will have cost them tens of thousands of pounds, and having put so much work into them, many owners are reluctant to sell at any price. It's a 1932 Ford Model B Tudor. How did you find it and what condition was it in? Um, he found it in a scrapyard in uh, Cromer in Norfolk and it was all in um, crates. What's the attraction of cars like this to you? Well they've got a lot of character, more, than, more so than what new cars have. When you look at the car, old car, you can see, you can imagine where it was whenever. <laughs> Does a car like this put you back into 30s America? Yes, certainly, yeah. Something is only worth as much as one of uh, somebody who wants it. Uh, if you've got somebody that really wants it desperately enough, they'll give you 30,000. If they don't, I should say I wouldn't take any less than 24,000 anyway, to be honest with you, because you're not going to get a car like this in this state for 24,000 or less, not as far as I'm concerned anyway. It was £430 in the yeah. showroom. Yeah. What would you think? Can no, you hazard a guess? No, I could not hazard a guess. My explanation to a question like that is, any car is only worth what the person's prepared to give you. You couldn't, you can't value a car. It's only worth what a person's prepared to give you. But nevertheless, when you saw it in the, when it was up for sale, what, 31, 32 years ago, 
it, it must well, have let's say it wasn't for sale. <laughs> I was practically given the car really? because I made a few promises. I promised that I knew the original owner's brother very, very well. I promised that I would. The, the brother, the original owner, had been ill for a number of years. The car had sat in, and I promised I'd make the car go. I made the car go. I wouldn't sell it while the brother lived. And the niece who was left the car, I had to give her a ride in the, the mother in law seat whenever I got the car going. So when I kept all those promises, I'm not telling you, but I really had the car for next to nothing. There is an intrigue. There is something which reminds people of their of their past. I think that you know the, the economy, I think, is recovering to some extent. People might have paid off their credit cards and they might be getting interested in, in something for the next summertime. Um, and I think yeah, people just like cars. And although you know in the classic car game we're up against a lot of people who don't like motor cars, and a lot of people think that cars are politically incorrect and uh, not quite the right thing to do, and they're, and they're ecologically unsound. Well, yes, everything in the modern world is, unfortunately. Motor cars are part of that mix. But I think people are genuinely interested in old cars. They're, they're, they like the good old bad days, you know. And from the NEC, we conclude our classic car special with a visit to an auction in Cheshire's Tatton Park. Came down from Manchester State to try and sell my car at the Tatton Show auction. It didn't reach the reserve that I placed on the car. Um, the reason I want to sell the car is to purchase a house and I thought there'd be a good opportunity to try and sell it. Um, I put a reserve in it of £6,000, um, but the bidding only reached £5,200. So at that point, the, the matter was over. We came down here today to have a nice day out among the auto jumblers and uh, the other nice cars that are uh, on view. And uh, so I, I thought uh, uh, at the present time I'm wanting to uh, reduce my workload, so I thought I'd put my Villeneuve Morris uh, in the auction and see what sort of money it brought. And uh, it was built in 1977. Uh, from templates made uh, and received from New Zealand. Uh, this is the only 1920 Bullnose Morris which is uh, running in the Bullnose Club. Today when, uh, when it came up for auction uh, I don't think they brought enough money with them because uh, they couldn't pay enough for me. And. Uh, Actually, they, uh, 
they snowed me under after the auction with wanting to buy the car and so I, I didn't sell it. Uh, I said no, they'll, they'll have to offer more money uh, than they offered. I've been in hospital and uh, I have to reduce the workload. So if anyone's interested they can, all, they can always come and offer me a good price at it. And uh, we, we are selling a car that they can use and run anywhere in the country with. Okay. That 1300 pound bed. That 13 bed. That 1300. 14. 1400. That 1400 pounds. That 1400 only bed. That 1400 pounds. Take it away then. 1400. That 1400 pounds. That 1400 bed then 1400. That 1400 all done there. That 1400 only bed. That 1400 only bed. Take it away then. I've had a reasonably successful sale today on, uh, for a September sale. Uh, the summer's nearly over now. Uh, people are looking today to sell cars um, due to troubles with storage. We've sold approximately 50% of the cars today, either through the sale itself or negotiating uh, sales afterwards. As you can see, we're still selling cars now. Uh, three people coming back after the auction, having seen cars go through, been to have a walk around the show, um, as, as they often do, coming back to the auction later on. And uh, we quite successfully closed deals right up until the end of the week. The golden rule if you're thinking of selling at a classic auction is to valet, polish and make your vehicle look irresistible. And on the day, don't be too upset if your precious jewel doesn't reach the reserve. Be realistic and realise that luck plays a great part. The next auction could have you drowning in a sea of flapping checkbooks.